better days. There will be better days. There will be better days. There will be better days. Let the waves wash over me. Let the wave wash over me. There will be better days. I am already under. Let the wave wash over me. Let the wave wash over me. Let the wave wash over me. I am already under. Let the wave wash over me. Let the wave wash over me. Let the wave wash over me. I am already under. Let the wave wash over me. I am already under. Let the wave wash over me. Let the wave wash over me. We light this chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. May it remind us of the divine spark in all of creation, the power of love to heal what is broken, and to be grateful for life's blessings each day. We light this candle in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and work for the day in which Black lives will be treated equitably with dignity and justice. Hello, my name is Reverend Teresa Soto and I am the lead minister at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland. I want to invite you to this video worship experience 
during a time of social distancing. We are a spiritually alive, radically inclusive, justice-centered congregation in downtown Oakland. And you're welcome to worship with us. Often we say exactly who's welcome. Queer people, people of color, people who want to build the beloved community. And that's still true. And normally you would be in our beautiful red brick historic building sharing that time with us. But right now, these times call for a flexibility that matches the importance of our cause. Building beloved community is important enough that many of us have dedicated our lives to it. And so as we share these messages and moments today, it is for that purpose, even if the format is different. I'm glad you're watching and I look forward to hearing more from you. Hi, it's Reverend Cherry. I miss you. I wish I was with you, but I'm at home and you're at home. We're all at home because we're in the middle of something kind of scary and uncertain. And in the middle of a crisis, people have different ways that they respond. Sometimes in a crisis, people look for someone to blame. They get angry at other people. Sometimes when we're feeling fear and anxiety, our hearts beat fast and our breathing gets shallow and these changes in our bodies makes it hard for us to stay grounded and open and think clearly and compassionately. And if that is ever happening to you, it's a good time to pull out some of your spiritual practices. Those of you who've been at Chalice Camp, do you remember when we made the list of all of the things that we do to create in our bodies the opposite feeling of stress? So those things like being in nature or uh, listening to music or talking with a friend, it's a good time to do some of those things right now. But there's another way that people respond in crisis, and that is that sometimes it brings out the best in us. Sometimes knowing our own fragility and vulnerability allows us to be open-hearted and more connected and more compassionate to others. Sometimes being in a crisis calls us to really be present and aware to the moment and to those people around us. As Unitarian Universalists, we are called to remember the interconnection of all existence and all beings everywhere who have inherent worth and value. So it calls us in this kind of time to find ways to use our wisest and most caring selves to bless the world in the spirit of love. I've been hearing stories about this kind of thing happening all over the world. I wonder if maybe you have too. The dean of the faculty at the school where I teach has family in Italy, and she shared with us a video of an evening time on a street in her family's neighborhood where people were on their balcony singing beautiful Italian songs to one another. They couldn't be together because they are like we are at home in their own houses with their families, but the sounds of their voices could carry and bless other people. When I go on a walk in my neighborhood, people stay a long way apart from each other, but they smile and they wave and they say hello much more than they usually do. And I've heard this the same thing at the grocery store. Some of the teenagers at Berkeley High School got permission from the Berkeley Police Department to offer a babysitting co-op to provide childcare to families where the parents are in the healthcare services and are considered essential employees and have to go to work. So that's another way that these youth have chosen to use their skills and abilities to bless the world in this time of crisis. My daughter tells me that on Tumblr, people are offering care and support to strangers, people that they don't even know. And some people are even starting to make lists 
of all of the good and beautiful things in the world that they can think of just to kind of be a balance to some of the ways that people are feeling worried or scared or afraid. So maybe later today, you and your family can get together and just tell some of the stories about the things that you've heard or the experiences that you've had of people using this crisis to bring out the best in themselves and to provide care and support for one another because really it's a time when we all need to stick together even though we can't be together and we're gonna get through it together. All right. I look forward to when I can see you again soon. Bye for now. Everybody ready? Yes. All right. Well, today I'm here with Corla Smith, the worship associate who has a reflection for us. And we're so grateful to be joined by Kathy Cade, a member of our community. Please go ahead, Corliss. Hi, everybody. Uh, I know you're there, even though I can't see you, which is an aspect of faith, I guess. Uh, here's a poem that offers some nourishment to the imagination, especially suited for this time. It's called, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth, an English poet of the 19th century. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. I say this poem is nourishing because it reminds me of the free riches of nature and memories. Wordsworth wrote that to him poetry was emotion recollected in tranquility. Many of us are now experiencing an unlooked for period of solitude. We certainly need tranquility. Being still is a difficult skill, not easy for me or for many others, I imagine but our enforced isolation does provide an opportunity to go slower, to look outside, really to look at the clouds and the new green leaves pushing up from their branches, to spend time with our children and mates and to enjoy them. 
It's an opportunity to go both deeper inside and deeper outside. Maybe you will write a poem in your solitude. Maybe you'll look at the pictures you've taken many of, but if you're like me, rarely look at. If I know you, yours, I know a lot of you are figuring out how to help people in need. This morning I saw a video on how to make masks for medical personnel that was totally easy sewing. I think I'll try to make some. I hope I'm not being banal along the lines of making lemonade when life deals you lemons or seeing a silver lining in that lonely cloud Wordsworth mentioned. There is a real chance here to study or to make something you've always wished you had time for. Now you've got it. American novelist Willa Cather said something inspiriting about how hard it is to start new things. She said, the only way to begin is to begin. Push yourself over the hump and start. And speaking of nourishment, please remember that our church relies on donations to nourish it and that you can still contribute to our community despite our distance. We need it. Over and out. Thank you. Fantastic. Each week, we take some time to remember the people that are in our hearts, whether in joy or in sorrow. We take that time and say the names of them out loud as we sit together in the sanctuary. Even though we're not sitting together this week, I'd like you to still take some time to say those names, and then we'll find ways to share those names among ourselves so we can hold them in community. We remember people who are ill, we give thanks for people who are recovering. We remember people who are afraid. We give thanks for people using their courage in community. We remember people who are struggling financially and who find this particular virus outbreak a challenge to their finances. We give thanks to people who are going to use their generosity during this time to hold those around them in care. For these and many other things, we give thanks and we hold them in our care. Good morning. Good morning. Can you uh, my, name yeah. oh, my name is Aida. Yeah. Oh, there you go. My name is Aida. And um, my spiritual practice is I am Roman Catholic. Great. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, so my spiritual practice offers me shelter in a way that I guess I did not expect when the coronavirus outbreak started. I guess I never thought that it would get this bad that actually mass would be canceled. Um, so when that came as news that there will be no mass, the first natural question occurred of, well, what about the Eucharist? Because that is one of those connections that you feel to God when you attend mass. And I learned of something very interesting from uh, a resource that talked about an act of spiritual communion. And apparently this was something that the saints said one they couldn't receive the Eucharist at Mass. And the idea is that the ultimate goal of our lives should always be communion with God. So basically, you have to take a moment to really invite Jesus into your heart. And that was just a very powerful idea to consider at this time um, to really feel connected to the spiritual practice, although I can no longer be in the church at Mass. Of course, they um, have daily Mass that is streamed live on YouTube at uh, my home parish, actually, and it's a great way to connect, but I feel like it has been an important step for me to learn about this act of spiritual communion that allows me to 
um, really feel kind of to, to die even though it can be very fast. And one of the things that I found very interesting that yesterday um, Pope Francis called for all Catholics around the world to pray their rosary at the same time. So at 1 p.m. Pacific time, uh, maybe, I, I, I don't know, there's no way to tell, but maybe billions of Catholics around the world sat down and took their beads and they tied their rosary so the world would heal from this terrible pandemic. And I think that was a powerful moment to all of a sudden feel connected, not just to your faith, but to everyone else around the world that are right now kind of praying together in this very tough time. Hello, my name is Reverend Teresa Soto, and I am the lead minister at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland. I want to invite you to this video worship experience during a time of social distancing. We are a spiritually alive, radically inclusive, justice-centered congregation in downtown Oakland. And you're welcome to worship with us. Often we say exactly who's welcome. Queer people, people of color, people who want to build the beloved community. And that's still true. And normally you would be in our beautiful red brick historic building sharing that time with us. But right now, these times call for a flexibility that matches the importance of our cause. Building beloved community is important enough that many of us have dedicated our lives to it. And so as we share these messages and moments today, it is for that purpose, even if the format is different. I'm glad you're watching, and I look forward to hearing more from you. What is the house we share anyway? It's three H's. The first is humanity. That reminds me of a line from white essayist and humorist, E.B. White. He says this, humanity, I love you. You're always putting the secret of life in your pants, forgetting it's there and sitting on it. What is he highlighting about our human experience with that funny line? Well, one of the things I take from it that I want to bring to you today is the idea that human beings are glorious and ridiculous. All the people that you meet during this time might be either one of those things or anything in between. It is hard work to be a person and people under pressure may act stressed. They may be unkind. They may be rude. They may be afraid. You have a source of compassion inside you that you can bring to meet those situations. And when your compassion is tired, you can rest. All of those are important things. When I first met Reverend Sherry, she told me something that I use all the time. She said that it's easy for people to have double feelings. And by that she means happy and sad, or sad and mad, or sad and curious, or any other combination that you can dream up. More than one thing is always happening, and that's even true for people's feelings. It matters for you to pay attention to your own feelings that way. Notice when you're having a hard time being the best person that you want to be. And it matters for other people's feelings. It's hard not to take people's behavior personally sometimes, but you can do it if you use your compassion as a framework to think about what that person is trying to express in the moment. Are you ready for the second H? It's hope. 
We share a house of hope. And what does that even mean? There are a lot of ways to describe hope. But for this time, I want us to think of hope as the certainty that when it's time to meet the challenges that arise, we will have the resources to do so. And how and why is that? Well, we are each other's hope. Gwendolyn Brooks, the poet, she was black and she wrote uh, specifically about black experiences a lot of the time, said, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. What does it mean to be each other's harvest? You're not a green bean. No, you're not. But you know what? We are constantly in community especially as it functions in a healthy way, both nurturing others and being nurtured by their care. And just like plants and trees know when their leaves come out and when their fruits come out and when they grow and when they rest, in that natural cycle of nurturing others and being nurtured, there will be fruit in that relationship, where we continue to develop as people by developing each other, by offering each other the resources that it takes to get through a time like this. We are each other's hope. The last one bears a little teasing apart. So the word hereafter generally means from now on. But it has been used to mean like heaven or like what happens when you're dead. People call that the sweet hereafter. What if this time is a doorway to a sweet hereafter, not when we're dead, but with the time that we have to do the work to which we're called? Yes, right? So I'm gonna say that the third H of our house is hereafter, but the living hereafter. The knowledge that we've gained during this time that there are times when it's, children, it's more important for children to be happy and safe than to be subject to a banking model of education. We've learned that Evictions can be suspended. We've learned that mortgages can be put in forbearance. We've learned that we can help each other in some significant ways that have to do with making it. But they weren't happening before. And in order to keep some of these gains in treating people like people, like valuable individuals who are part of a community who make a difference by their very existing, we're going to have to hold on. We're going to have to say we can't go back to the way it was because this is how we mean to be. Interdependent, interconnected, and making the best of this world. I love you so much. I know that this time is really hard on you as a congregation, but you're being diligent to do everything that you can do. And we're gonna schedule more time together. We're gonna have more opportunities to say how we're doing, and we'll continue to move forward. Here's what I want you to remember. The cause of building beloved community is really important. And so that's why we adapt. Not because we can't think of anything else to do. I'm sure that some of you can think of a hundred things to do. 
and the cause is what calls us forward. Building community, taking care of each other, living into that humanity, hope, and from now on of making a difference. We can do it. We can do it together. Let it be so. Let us be the ones who make it so. Out of all the things you could choose to be to yourself during this time, I hope you will choose to be gentle. I hope you approach your fears and wounds and anxieties with tenderness. No one knows how to do this right. There is no manual for this time. You are doing enough. Please be kind to you. These words from Emma Zek. I hope you have a wonderful week and I'll be in touch soon.